Mate, put your wheel out back. So the fire service asked us, made contact, could we bring it in? And the work central kitchen would provide it, but they had nobody to deliver it. So we uh, we offered that we would come in. Um, and the problem is, is we're the only ones at the minute. So obviously we're limited to how much we can get in. Um, and obviously with the shell being so close, um, it's kind of a factor too. But we've always come in, we've never not made it. Um, but the fighting is getting closer and closer from the south. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. But the future. old kitchen uh, themselves, they are scared to come here. Right? Yeah, their drivers don't want to come here. You know. Yeah. Also, we deliver up to Solidor for the same reason. They don't want to go there because it's, uh, it's too close. So we've been contacted because they know we work here. Uh, okay. Okay, let's go. Plan. Okay. Yeah, we're here in Bombay. Fucking Russians! Fucking Russians! <laughs> what do we need water for? We're going to bring it over to the east, to the family. Oh, to the family? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah let's go. go. This is work. Tell me, you're going to get that easier when she's that size. You're not going to get any information here. People aren't coming in here. We can't. We're just sitting there. И ребенок 12 лет кричит. Да, вот мама ее, мы с соседями. Yeah, we can take them off. На криком кричит, я тут буду умирать. Мы не можем ничего с ней сделать. 80 лет. Вчера было. Мы еще с выводом. Ну понятно, мы все понимаем. Что тут ось уже, ось вчера у ней вчера сгорела через четыре комнаты, через четыре дома сгорела полностью с этот самый кухня. Вчера сами тушили, нигде ничего нету, ни муж он Это не причина для вас выезжать, або подумать про то, что может подкинуться? Она не знала, У меня что тут ничего нету, что там ничего нету. Она не знала, что тут ничего нету, что там ничего нету. Она не знала, что тут ничего нету, что там ничего нету. Ну тогда, это больше причин для вас. Same thing. Look, like, it's not. Like, it's not. We know it's not perfect, right? You can imagine. Um, like, это не самый идеальный вариант однозначно, но это в любом случае лучше, чем просто оставаться здесь под разделами и позволять россиянам убивать наших граждан. Просто давать им эту возможность. Это не сможет длиться долго, и рано или поздно это не придет конец. They're like one kilometer away. Они меньше чем километр находятся по расстоянию от этого кафе. Меньше километра, Александр. Без света, без ничего сожрем. И то что хоть мы в своем доме уехали, у нас тоже рассказывают, ты денег ты что, ты пошел бы на две тысячи выжил? На данный момент ничего. You mightn't have your house much longer. No, you know, I'm not. I'm, telling, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm not trying to be an asshole. Не подумай, что он вот просто грубый. It's just fact. Но это Реальность, да, которая есть на данный момент. Это не тот случай, когда подождем, будет лучше. 
к сожалению. It kind of really depends on the family. So, if if it's been very heavy the night before, uh, or their house is after taken a hit or an impact, they could be ready straight away. So you'll come to have all your stuff ready. Other people you will call and like this, you try to convince them. Um, a lot of reasons is to just they say they don't have any options. So they say I don't have money. If I go somewhere, I can't afford a house. Some of them will just say I was born here. I'm gonna die here. They don't. It's, it's not obviously not rational thinking. So like we've often been in so we've been here a lot and we've been in a lot of areas where we've gone to families and they've said like no no we're not going, we're not going. But then you could get a phone call in two days and it's when you arrive back the house has been hit. So do, while they still physically have a home or a cellar, they feel somewhat safe and they say, No, I'm never going. But it could be hit the next night or that night, and then when you come back in the next day, they're ready to go. But it, some people it takes a lot. They, they literally have to have nothing left, and then they'll go. Others, they're the people who've left already, so they have left because it's basically just it's, it's too unsafe. Um, but the older people are a, a bit more stubborn to leave. Now, it's their house, and you understand it. Like this is their home; they don't want to leave it. Um, they're afraid if they leave it, they might never get back. But uh, it's my understanding that you don't take the first no, you keep coming. Yes. <laughs> well, look, our whole aim here is to, you know, help people. So, like, if we just arrive in and say, do you want an evac? And they say no, and we drive on. That's not really, you know, um, the people, sometimes they need to convince them. And as I said, sometimes it's just fear. Um, most of the time when we get even halfway out of the town, to start leaving like we've had families in the back just start crying um, it's just stress relief so they come out to see it and then they're actually amazed that that when you get say into the likes of Constance Livka that there's people walking around in the shop so some of them think that the whole of Ukraine is like this and it's only well and that's like 40 minutes out the road and all of a sudden they see oh supermarkets you've got taxis you've got buses and then they kind of get this kind of relief um, so Yeah, like it's not a good idea because we keep coming back and sometimes we keep getting no's but we we keep coming back until we can. You now we give them the, basically as much opportunity and time as we can. You know? Когда она а мы не поняли, короче, слышишь, кто-то кричит. Это Не, серьезно. Вот, А що вона не бачу світити з глини чи що? Кирпіч, обмазаний гліною. Через вікно ви вивели, да? Да, да. Да, ну ви даєте. Ну, ми ждем перемогу і ждем, коли будемо встановлювати свої гори. Тому всі на місці. А Моцарт вам щось іноді привозить, чи ви так просто дружите? Ні, привозять, звісно. Вони нам і водичку, спасибо, возять. І ми просили лікарства, лікарства возять. І нам запчасти купили на бензопилу, а ми не могли їх забрати з Краматорська. Большое їм спасибо, вони нам ці, ну, забрали, заїхали і привезли нам. Угу. Тому що дрова ж бензопилою угу. напилять. Так Но ви їх давно знаєте, так? Ну, місяць, мабуть. Ну, мабуть. Діто з місяць. Тебе вчили ховатися? Ти вмієш ховатися? Да? Куди ти ховаєшся? Там, де дірки. Там, де дірки. 
Не, ну на улице мы куда тебе, куда ты всегда бежишь? Подъезд, конечно. Правильно, до лифта. Сейчас. So, Andy, you're a former Marine. How could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Or how did you end up here? I was in the U.S. Marine Corps for 31 years. I was in Marine Special Operations for 10 years. And bottom line is, I I retired three years ago. I came out here in February. No, I'm sorry, first week in March to be a journalist, as a matter of fact, not as good a journalist as you are, but nevertheless, uh, I came out as a freelance journalist uh, during the, you know, the siege of Kiev, basically. And I very really, I, I wrote a handful of articles, but I started to feel that what I was doing was trivial. That, I mean, you remember how that was, right? They were handing out AK-47s on the street to anyone between the age of 18 and 60. And a friend of mine in the, and the Ukrainian military reached out to me and he said, hey Andy, we need help training these guys. Within a few days, they have to go and fight the Russians. None of them have fired a weapon before. All they have is their courage and, and their determination to defend their city. And, you know, I, I, no one can say no to a plea like that. Uh, I had with me, because I'd run into them, uh, two or three other Marines, surprisingly, all retired. And we put together a plan. We brought some more trainers in from the United States very quickly, like in a couple of days. And we started training the territorial defense guys in Kiev. Remember, it's the Russians are closing on the city. And these guys, we'd put them through a five-day training course. They would get in their vehicles and they would go and fight the Russians. So it was a very difficult time. By the time that the Russians were pushed back, remember the beginning of April, uh, we, were, we were also, uh, by the way, up in Bucha, uh, right after the Russians left, we saw the massacres there and it made us very determined to stay. And by then we had some donor funds coming in and my colleagues said, hey, we don't want to go home, let's stay here and, see, and do what we can for, for the Ukrainian. The motor groups, how, how did you come up with this name? Actually, it wasn't me. It came with it. It's a brilliant name. One of my guys came up with it, and by the by the time someone said to me, "Hey, boss, what do you think? We'll call ourselves the Mozart Group." Everyone was already calling us the Mozart Group. So I was ambivalent because we're not the Wagner Group. You couldn't find an organization further away from the Wagner Group, right? We are yes, we're all professional military. That separates us from the Wagner Group right there. We don't carry guns. We're not fighting. We are training Ukrainian soldiers here in Donbass, and we're rescuing civilians. Period. That's what we do. Um, you okay? Of course, we, you know, all of us are very skilled in the military. Of course, we could fight, but there's 40 of us and we can have a much greater effect training Ukrainians and doing these things. There's another reason why we're not carrying weapons. We are not mercenaries. We are not a private military company even. We are a volunteer organization. What happened two weeks ago, uh, Dathan, my team leader, was called into a village near here where we are standing. Uh, and the Wagner group had come in and they had, they had burned alive a man in front of his family. And uh, Dathan and his team had to come in to take the body out. We've seen their cruelty. I've seen their cruelty in Syria. I've, I've been in Mali, I've been all over uh, Africa. The Wagner group are quite frankly, as you and I both know, criminals. They have nothing to do with me. What we do, for instance, what we do here, 
evacuating civilians, you could say, well, you guys don't need to be in the military to do that. But I'll tell you what the military does for you. It teaches you self-discipline. It, it gives you a good sense of judgment about danger. Um, it, it forces you to get along with people around you, to work as a team. These are all very important. It also, we have a common we have a common experience. Even though we're in different militaries, we have a common background. What that means is we kind of have the same personalities and personalities are everything when you don't have uh, a, a formalized structure of discipline, you have to get along with people around you. We call it emotional intelligence. This organization has a really high level of emotional intelligence. So you're here for long? Yes, I am here as long as the money, as the donor money comes in and as long as to do this. Um, and as long as the war lasts. So what does inspire you to come here again and again from sunny Florida? <laughs> Not the weather. <laughs> I can That's see this. Sure. <laughs>